I use in the policy gradient theorem, but never bothered to prove it. I find that uh, a lot of proofs skip a lot of details. Can you understand every line of the proof? Here I will try to do just that. Go through an existing proof and try to explain every line. Welcome to the video series that will go through the proof of the policy gradient theorem. And I plan to make this multiple videos. So stay tuned. This is how I want to break down this series. What you're watching now, this is the introduction. We'll define our problem and notation here. Uh, then we'll have a single video for every line in the proof. Then maybe there'll be some conclusion to wrap things up. Why do it this way? Well, mostly because I know I'll mess up and that way I can replace any individual video that will have a mistake in it. There's also something I'm not telling you, but you'll have to wait till the end of the series to find out what. Okay, let's get started. So in my reinforce video, I glossed over what makes reinforce actually work. I mean, what theoretical foundation is it actually based on? Uh, well, it's based on policy gradient theorem. In fact, it's probably the most direct translation of the policy gradient theorem into code. Uh, what I mean is, unlike other methods that involve additional approximation mechanisms like critic that's used to estimate a value function in actor critic, the reinforce it pretty much applies the, the policy gradient theorem in the most direct way without any additions. Here I want to show how to go from policy gradient theorem to reinforce. We'll just focus on the proof of the policy gradient theorem. Perhaps we'll leave that uh, connection to another video. All right, before we get started with the proof, uh, let's get some notation out of the way. So here we have a policy, some policy pi. It takes some state and produces an action. I really like to think of this as a neural network. This neural network has some parameters, weights, theta, and the output of the neural network is a softmax over some actions. And the final action being selected is A, and the input is some vector S or tensor S, which is our state. So the reason I like to think of it this way is because when we then look at the definition in the book, it kind of intuitively makes more sense. Uh, the book describes this as the probability of taking action A at time T, given that environment is in state S. Also here, theta is the policy's parameter ve vector. I think that this uh, probability distribution or A, imagining it as a softmax, makes it easier, for me at least. So that was the policy. Now let's move on to the performance measure, J. I find that this is probably the most important point, and I see a lot of people skip over this. The performance measure is something that te tells you how well your policy is performing. So in the episodic case, where the task has some end, for example, like drive to some destination, the definition of the performance measure is simply the value of the start state under this parameterized policy pi of theta. So meaning if we start in some state S0, for example, and we measure the value at that state when using our policy, then this is our performance measure. So what, you know, what is the, uh, the value here? Well, the value here is just the expected return G when starting in this state and following the policy thereafter. And of course, the return is simply sum of all the rewards until the end of the episode. So the ne next interesting question to ask is why is performance measure a function of theta? Why isn't it just J, for example? Well, we can think of uh, performance measure as being parameterized by theta because suppose we have a given policy uh, with one set of weights, pi of theta. So we, this is that neural network that's parameterized by theta. So this is one set of weights. So this policy will give us one performance and another policy with different set of weights will give us a different performance. J is conditioned or parameterized by theta uh, the weights of that neural network. And that makes sense. Uh, depending on the, which policy you're running, you'll get different performances. So if we are given some policy, pi of theta, and we have its performance measure, j of theta, then we can optimize the theta 
to get the maximum J because we seek to maximize the performance measure. The updates on theta approximate the gradient ascent in J. So unlike the gradient descent for a loss, we are actually doing the gradient ascent on this performance measure. So our update to theta is using this gradient of J of theta here. And this is just the stochastic estimate whose expectation approximates the gradient of the performance measure with respect to theta t. So what this means is, as we are unrolling episodes, as we're gathering more experience, we are sampling this gradient. We can't get the true gradient of this performance measure because we'd have to gather all possible experiences ever and then take a step in that direction. But just like in supervised learning, we're doing, we're kind of getting batches of this experience and we're going in that direction of maximizing the gradient. So this is exactly what gives us the new policy parameters. So J is parameterized by theta because it depends on the policy itself and the policy is parameterized by theta. So I hope that makes sense um, because at least for me initially it wasn't clear why is performance measure parameterized by theta. Now let's look at the policy gradient theorem itself. So here is our policy gradient theorem. First note that each gradient here is a column vector of partial derivatives with respect to components of theta. So these things here are column vectors. This is not just one uh, scalar, this is multiple numbers here. The distribution here of mu of s is the on policy distribution under pi. So what does that mean? It just means how often you're visiting a certain state when you're using some policy. If you're driving different routes from different points in the city, how often are you visiting the on-ramp on some highway? This is used to weigh how much we care about some specific state. Clearly, if we're visiting some state a lot, we want to weigh it more. And if we never visit some state, like in a different city, then we don't really care about the experience from that state. So the mu of s really is a fraction of time spent in state s. Now the q here is the action value function. This tells you what is the value of taking action a in state s. Now let's move on to the proof. Now here is the proof that we're going to go through. This is found on page 325 of the introduction to reinforcement learning second edition by Sutton and Barton. So what I will do here is number each line of the proof so we can go through each line separately. So next time we'll actually start our proof with the first line. If you'd like to skip ahead, you can do the exercise 3.18 in the book and you'll have the first line of the proof done. All right, see you next time. Bye-bye.